it was still very much the steam age in June of 1944, when the second prototype, light Pacific type steam locomotive, emerged from the company's Angus shops in Montreal. The company had built over a thousand team locomotives in its own plant since 1883, and this was to be the last all new engine they were to produce. Her number was 1201, class G5. She and her sister, number 1200, were to be followed by 100 more almost identical G5s built by the Montreal Locomotive Works and the Canadian Locomotive Company of Kingston, Ontario. The 1200s were old-fashioned in exterior appearance, and no wonder, for they were patterned after a very successful CPR design that was over 30 years old. However, to those familiar with steam locomotive design, the G5s were quite modern in that they incorporated state-of-the-art technology. They were truly the most modern light Pacifics in North America. Despite their rather short lifespan of 12 to 16 years, they proved to be excellent engines. When the 1201 rolled out of the Angus shops that summer of 1944, she had cost $83,349 plus tax. She was a bargain. 1201's life with CP was all in Eastern Canada. In fact, most of it was within 140 miles of her birthplace. For many years, she was the regular engine on train 29 and 30, operating between Perth and Montreal. She was a babied engine by both shop and engine crews. She was given special care, for she was special and well-liked. 1201 was only 16 years old, but the railway had moved to diesels, so she was relegated to a scrap line. She languished for nearly six years at both the St. Luke Yard in Montreal and at Angus, her birthplace. Stories have it that each time she got to the front of the scrap line, the boys didn't have the heart to cut her up, so they put her at the back of the line and cut up other engines. In 1966, she was purchased by the National Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa for display in a yet-to-be-built museum. She was now a museum piece, destined to stand quietly in Locomotive Hall for the rest of her days. Twelve oh one spent six years standing quietly with half a dozen other team locomotives. I'm going to check the operation of the brakes with the independent brake valve. Will you let me know when they go on and off, please? Sure thing. On May 1st, 1973, the masonry wall behind 1201 was removed, and she was on her way to a CP Rail Roundhouse in Toronto for an overhaul to make her operable. The day of the steam excursion train in Ottawa had arrived. During the summers of 1973, 74, and 75, the National Museum of Science and Technology, the National Capital Commission, and the Bytown Railway Society operated steam passenger train excursions using charter equipment. The runs were to Carleton Place, Ontario and Wakefield, Quebec. While this was going on, the rebuild of 1201 continued in Toronto. It took three years to complete.
Some of the major work required included removal, procurement, and replacement of all boiler tubes and flues. Needle gun cleaning of the inside of the 8,000 gallon tender tank. Removal and replacement of four of the six driving wheel crank pins, which in turn required the removal of the driving wheels. Design, construction, and installation of a 2,600 gallon oil tank and the necessary firing apparatus. Removal of all the machinery associated with coal fire, and unexpected problems like the cracked boiler top check valve, which required a study to determine how to repair it. And there was enough other work to keep the relatively small workforce busy for three years. And last but hardly least, there was a paint job, complete with correct CPR lettering and numbering. By April of 1976, the job was complete. The Ontario Rail Association, who had contracted to do the rebuild work with the National Museum of Science and Technology in concert with CP Rail, gave 1201 a workout in the Toronto terminal and a short mainline run. The old girl performed as she was intended to. On June 6, 1976, 1201 came back to Ottawa, running under her own power. The following day, she went to Wakefield to check out the newly installed turntable in preparation for her excursion career, which began immediately. For the next 10 summers, 1201 and her train became a regular summer feature between Ottawa and Wakefield. At the beginning, it was a Sunday-only affair, but was soon expanded to Sunday and Wednesday. Generally speaking, the train was well-received and well-patronized. By 1975, the museum had purchased a former Canadian Pacific lightweight combination baggage buffet coach, number 3051. The car was given a major overhaul and put into service. Later on, a diesel electric generating set was installed in 3051 to provide electric power to other coaches and to operate 3051's new air conditioning system. The baggage area of the car is used by the service crews and as a location for spare parts and tools. Also acquired in the mid-70s was a heavyweight coach, Micmac. Built for the CP in 1929, this 87-ton car also received a major overhaul. Completely refinished inside and out, it was lettered for CP's subsidiary, Dominion Atlantic, and named Micmac as a tribute to the native peoples of Canada's Atlantic provinces. It rolls on six wheels. The last mid-70s car acquisition was a so-called lightweight coach at 62 tons. Built in 1925 for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad in the United States. This car, lettered Canada Central and named Sandpoint, had a checkered career in both the U.S. and Canada. At one time, it was operated by the Ontario Northland Railway. With the acquisition of the three cars and the retention of two of the least Ontario Rail heavyweights, the Wakefield train continued to operate until September 1st of 1985, when the last trip was made. During the course of the Wakefield operation, 1201 and the cars were also involved in several other events. She appeared in the movies, was chartered by CP Rail to participate in their 100th corporate anniversary. And on Sunday, October 16th, 1977, under the heaviest security imaginable, she hauled a very special train to Wakefield, conveying Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. Late in 1982, museum staff began a second major overhaul of 1201. This work was divided into two parts, the boiler and the engine. 
the boiler had its tubes and flues removed, as were all external boiler attachments, jacket and lagging. A comprehensive inspection of the boiler barrel and tube sheets revealed they were still in good condition. Some rebuilding would be required in the smoke box, especially at the bottom, which is a high wear area. A small number of stay bolts were replaced in the firebox, and all firebox corners were built up. The 32 flues were removed and sandblasted, inspected, and safe ended using material from the earlier refit. The tubes were all replaced with new material. After all the boiler work was complete, an extensive period of cold and hot testing began. Some faults were found and corrected, and the pressure vessel was again certified for service on June 16, 1983. The old girl was now in good shape again for whatever the future would bring. The route from Ottawa to Pembroke, Ontario, used by the 1201 and her excursion train, is Canadian National's Beechburg subdivision. In the beginning, it was a portion of the Canadian Northern Railway main line. It's also known unofficially as the Valley Line. Built by the Canadian Northern and completed in 1915, it provided the CNR with a more direct route to the west, enabling them to compete with the Canadian Pacific Railway. The excursion train departs Ottawa from the site of the National Museum of Science and Technology in the southeast end of the city. Using an industrial branch line, we soon enter the main and work upgrade to the joint CNCP Walkley Yard.
At the west end of the yard, the train crosses the C.P. Prescott subdivision, which was originally the Bytown and Prescott Railway, Ottawa's first railway, opening in December of 1854. We finally join the Beechburg subdivision at Wash Junction. This is the junction where VIA trains from Ottawa Station join the Valley Line. Just past this point, the train makes its first river crossing of the day over the Rideau.
Upon reaching Fitzroy Harbor, we cross over the wide expanse of the Ottawa River, a favorite with the passengers as the bridge provides a really breathtaking view. The train now enters the province of Quebec. At Norway Bay, it's the first run past of the day. Many of the camera and recorder buffs will get off here to take advantage of the thunderous passage of the train. Engineers Mark Merriman and Tim Verge know what the ticket holders want to see, and they're happy to put on a good show.
The next stop is at Bristol, where the train will be met by the local volunteer fire department. Here, the age-old ritual of a steam locomotive taking water will occur. The method employed today to replenish 1201's 8,000 gallon tender tank uses small high pressure truck mounted pumps and truck tanks of water. This is now the only way as the massive railway water storage tanks and trackside stand pipes or hydrants are all long gone. While the water pours into the tender, the Bytown Railway Society's road foreman of engines measures the level in the fuel oil tank ensures that water treatment compound is added, makes an inspection of the locomotive, and confers with the engineers, firemen, and car foremen. Leaving Bristol, we continue our run up the valley through the communities of Clarendon and Portage du Four. The 1200's 70-inch diameter driving wheel permits an authorized maximum speed of 75 miles per hour, a tractive effort of 34,000 pounds. Many 1200's were known to have unofficially exceeded 85 miles per hour, some even 90. We speed through here and soon recross the Ottawa River back into the province of Ontario. Again, it's a magnificent crossing of the river, and with our speed held down, the passengers can really enjoy the scenery. Once back in Ontario, we pass through rolling countryside. 
Near Forester's Falls, spectacular views of the train can be had from the roadside, and many people are out to witness 1201's passing. is the scene of another run past. In fact, passengers and onlookers are treated to two run pasts. And what a spectacle. 1201 working hard at speed, her whistle screaming out a signal, and the heavyweight coaches following the blasting Pacific.
Bye. Some 90 miles northwest of Ottawa, the train reaches her destination, Pembroke. A small city of 15,000, Pembroke lies on the edge of the Ottawa River. The train stops at the CN station, which last saw regular passenger service in 1978, when Via's supercontinental train made its last run. At this point, 1201 and combination car 3051 are cut off from the rest of the train and dispatched to the Y for turning. A touch of Pembroke's lumber heritage remains as 1201 and the Combine are wide amongst piles of fresh cut lumber. The Y forms part of the remains of what was once the CN Loxley subdivision. Built by the Pembroke Southern Railway, this line linked the city with the former Ottawa, Armprior and Perry Sound Railway at Golden Lake. The OA and PS was owned by lumber baron J.R. Booth, still a well-known name in the valley. The modern domeless boiler carries a working pressure of 250 PSI. Two of the engines, 1216 and 1231, had all welded boilers, which were quite successful. Some of the significant modern mechanical features are aluminum vestibule cab, a multiple throttle, mechanical lubrication, a roller bearing engine truck, cast engine and tender truck frames, a mechanical stoker, a number 8 ET brake system, frame mounted air compressor and water pump, cast pilot and tender buffer beams, modern spring loaded radial buffer between engine and tender, and many compressed air operated auxiliaries.
With 1201 and her combine wide, they proceed back to the station, where they're coupled up to the rest of the train. Servicing of 1201 now begins. Once again, water is taken, side and main rods are greased, as are all pins and bushings in the valve gear. The mechanical lubricator is refilled, fuel oil level checked, and the tender journal boxes checked for both temperature and oil level. All other bearings in the entire train are checked, and a complete inspection of engine and cars is made prior to leaving. If any adjustments or minor repairs are to be done, they're done here, but it's usually unnecessary. Then it's a clear run back to Ottawa, and the end of another day of the best of railway travel, steam travel. <laughs>